I want to thank you, President Saunders, for not just what you said for us, but for everything that you have done and are doing for the University of West Florida. I have the electronic version of Pensacola News Journal on my tablet, and our offices are in southern New Jersey, and I look at the Pensacola News Journal every day along with the Wall Street Journal. So just to let you know, I follow everything that's going on here, and it's remarkable. And you know, Dean O'Keefe, you and following Dean Rinelli, who I worked with when I was here, you've done an extraordinary job here. And there's a special person, and those of you who are at UWF know this, but the push behind all of this, the person who spends endless hours, who was even the one who emailed me back and forth with logistics, Dr. Sherry Hartnett, who this is her love and her passion. She does an amazing job. I want to thank Sandy, uh, one of my amazing co-workers, and what I'd also like to do, you know, you talk about being an alumna of something. Well, I have a lot of Gulf Power corporate alumna here. If you all stand up, that if you're with Gulf Power or Southern Company, <laughs> awesome. Because I did spend 31 years there. So Sandy told you about a story that I always like to tell Wilma Rudolph, and I'm going to start with a little different story this morning. It's another woman who is extremely inspirational for a lot of reasons. And after this, later this afternoon, if you want to Google her, her name is Bonnie St. John. Let me tell you a little bit about Bonnie St. John and why you should know who this woman is. Bonnie St. John was born in Detroit, Michigan. She had a sister. Her father left before she was ever born. Her mother, who worked hard at night while working two jobs and going to school at night and raising two girls, got her teaching degree and moved her girls to San Diego. Um, and so she grew up in San Diego, and when she was five years old, her right leg quit growing and had to be amputated. And then her mother remarried a man who had really faked her off and who ended up sexually abusing Bonnie. So Bonnie was this young African-American woman who had had this very difficult life and was not the person that you think would go on and would change the world, and yet Bonnie has. Let me tell you a little bit about how she did that. When Bonnie was 16 years old, first of all, her mother, they saved and saved to get a prosthesis for her right leg. When she was 16 years old, a friend said, come snow skiing with us. And she said, how can I snow ski? I can't risk breaking my prosthesis. And how will I ski with one leg? And her friend convinced her to go, and her mother encouraged her to go. So at 16 years old, she went skiing for the first time. And she loved it. She said, I felt so free. When I was coming down those mountains, it was as if I was just one with nature, and everything was wonderful. And interestingly, just three years later, she tried out for the Paralympic ski team for Austria in 1984, and she made it. She barely made it and got the last uh, slot. So here she is, three years, she's 20 years old now. She's had four years of skiing. She's in the final run of the giant slalom. And she had a great first run. And here was the person who barely made it, only been skiing four years. And after the first run, she was ahead. So she gets up for her second run. She's about to take off. And she'd noticed that all the women before her had slipped on this icy patch. So here she was saying, do I go flat out? in Dr. Saunders' words, or do I make sure that I don't fall? She said, I decided to go flat out. She gets to the bottom to the icy patch, and she slips and falls. And she said a part of her said, just stay here, stay here. But her training, her discipline said, you get up and you finish this race, and she did. And the amazing thing, Bonnie won the bronze medal. What was even more amazing, the person who won the gold medal also fell. And Bonnie said this, I learned that winners aren't people who don't fall. Winners are people who get up. And the gold medal winners get up the fastest. <laughs> she, she went on to go to Harvard, graduate from Harvard, Rhodes Scholar in England, went on to serve in three different administrations, starting with the Clinton administration, and she still does motivational speaking across the country. But I love the lesson of Bonnie St. John. Winners are going to fall. You're going to fall. Don't get discouraged and say, I fail. You get yourself back up, and you get yourself back up fast and put it behind you. Because as women, a lot of times, we obsess about what we could have done better, what we should have done better, where we failed, as opposed to what we did that got us to where we are and the worth that we have, just because of who we are. 
because, because of who we're created to be and the specific skills and talents that we have. So I want to talk a little bit about women in leadership, women building stronger companies and communities. I'm going to talk about business at first, and then I'm going to give you a little bit about my background and three critical things that happened in my career that changed me as a person and as a professional. And then I'm going to end with a few stories of some of the heroes that I get to work with every day at American Water. So let's talk about women in business. This is an interesting fact. Credit Suisse, Ernst & Young, and Catalyst have done studies, and they have looked at women in S&P 500 companies, biggest companies in the country. You're part of the S&P 500 index. My company is part of that index, which, by the way, out of the 500 CEOs of S&P 500 companies, there are 26 women, or 5.2%. So, but, but listen to the stats. So when they looked at women, companies run by women CEOs, here are some of the statistics. Companies run by women CEOs have higher profits, higher returns on equity, higher returns on capital, more innovation, less leverage or debt, they go bankrupt less often, they have higher employee satisfaction and employee retention, and interestingly, when they looked at S&P 500 CEOs and they looked at women over their CEO tenure and men over theirs, the women grew their company stock 103.4% over their CEO tenure compared to the men who grew at 69.5%. Wow. Actual stats. <laughs> and yet when you look at that, what's even more confounding is then you look at, so who are in the jobs? So when you look at those same S&P 500 companies, 45% of all employees are women. That's good. Then you go to first line and mid-level management. Then it drops from 45% to 37%. Still not too bad. So now you go to senior manager, director, first line VP. You go from 37 to 26.5%. Then you go to the five most highly paid. In publicly traded companies, you can go online. We are required to file with SEC, and you get to see what the top five people in every publicly traded company makes. Of those five highest paid, only 11% are women, national, or in the S&P 500, and 5% are CEOs. So you look at the stats that show performance, and then you look at the stats in terms of what we have today, and we've just got some making up to do. There's some things we need to do. So what I, I look at is, and actually I did this talk in Philadelphia last week to a group of women there, what is it we need to do? What is it that we can do ourselves? Because I have to tell you, I don't believe in a victim mentality. Now, there's some people who are truly victims. I'm not talking about that type of abuse. I'm talking about when things knock you down and you pick yourself up and you say, I hear what you're saying, but I don't believe you and I don't agree with you. So let me tell you a little bit about myself and the times in my life when I faced that a couple of times. First of all, I'm here to tell you that I'm the American dream. I'm the first person on either side of my family to ever go to college. My dad's parents were alcoholics and he was on the street at 14 in Piedmont, Alabama. My mom was the ninth of nine kids of a dirt poor farmer in Alabama. But my parents believed in the American dream and from the time I was little, they said, Susan, you can be whatever you wanna be because we live in the United States of America. And the fact that they never went to college didn't matter because every time we played games, they're both so smart, they just never had the opportunity to go to school. And my brother and I both have advanced degrees. My brother has a, a doctorate from a family who grew up in a situation where they worked so hard. My mom and dad started when I was little and worked in a cotton mill. My dad retired as a pipe fitter. So when I say I'm the American dream, I mean I'm the American dream. You know, I remember when I was four and five years old, we lived in a mobile home before my dad got a really good job as a pipe fitter and we got a nice house that we could live in. So I tell you that to understand that when I stand up here and you go, well, you have no idea, I really do. I paid my way through college. I tutored at Auburn calculus and physics for athletes, and when I wasn't tutoring, I got to study. So I actually got to study a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, I'll move on from there. So I am the American dream, and so as I started my career, as Sandy shared with you, I, I graduated college in about three years. I was 21 years old <clears throat> with engineering school at Auburn, and I went to work as a nuclear power plant engineer. So there's three instances in my life that I want to tell you that the decision I made made all the difference in the world. And the first one was when I was 23 years old. I went to work for a person who did not think women should be engineers. And he was very open about it. And I was so naive, and it was 19, early 1980s, 
And um, so one day, I find out that he, I went to him very honestly, I was getting mediocre performance reviews, and I said, Jerry, what do I have to do? I, you know, because I had done all this work at the power plant, and we had reduced a lot of the problems we had there. And he looked at me in the eye, and he said, you're doing great. I saved the high scores for men with families so I can give them more money. He looked, this was a day and age where you could look somebody in the eye and say that and think it was okay. <laughs> Um, and you know, and then I found out he was taking my name off of stuff and putting his name and everything. So I tell you though, I went to the restroom, because at that time I'd never cried at work, went to the restroom, I cried in the stall and I thought, I have a choice to make. I can get bitter and I can blame the entire company or I can realize that this is his problem and I'm going to show him how wrong he is. And choosing the latter of those two is why I'm standing here today. So I worked hard. About a year later, he got a different manager who I'd worked with who calls me in his office and says, you know, I don't understand these, these marks and blah, 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 and I know your work. I very innocently, truly innocently, looked at him and repeated every word that had been told to me. And his, all the color drained of his face. Um, he goes, what job do you want? <laughs> Sir, I'm, and actually, at that time, it was a long time ago at Alabama Power, for those of you at Gulf Power, a long time ago, and they had wanted me in another organization in the company, and, the, and this group had been blocking me from interviewing because they didn't want to lose me. And I said, I want the opportunity to bid for this job. I did, I got it, and I got a broader background. So that was the first thing that happened, that that decision put me on a path which helped me get here today. The second example is something that happened right here in Pensacola on September the 16th, 2004, those of you who remember what happened on September the 16th, 2004, when Hurricane Ivan came through, we have had and they still have the most remarkable team of people at Gulf Power that I've ever met. So there were about 40 of us at Pace, at Pace Boulevard, where our office was then before we sold the building. The building was supposedly built to hurricane standards, had the metal shutters over the windows. About 1.30 a.m., the eye of the storm comes through. And our guy who is supposed to head up logistics is in a room with all of the things. We have people coming in from all over the country to help us the next day. We knew it was going to be bad. And a plate glass window came in under the steel. Some of you will remember this from golf. Came in, fell on top of Andy, and he is crawling out with glass in his knees and his back. And I, we were all in cots in different cubes and offices, so I, none of us could sleep. And I came out, we had these these young call center reps who had volunteered to be there in the building, and we didn't know which windows were coming through. It was a very scary time. So we got everybody in the basement. Andy was there, he was going into shock, and my husband's a physician, so I said, okay, Andy, put your head between your knees. I got tweezers and I started picking glass out of his back and his shoulders, thinking, this is, the head of, this is our guy who knows where all the crews are coming in. I'm afraid he's going to get hurt, you know, all this stuff. It's like, but there's one thing I knew, which is there was so much fear at that time that if I had shown any fear or weakness, I don't know what would have happened. Lisa, I see you nodding. You remember that well. And um, so we got him into the uh, one area. We we're on a generator. We got him into a room with air conditioning. We got everybody in the basement. And the next morning, we walked out, and for those of you who lived through that, you remember what it was like when you walked out the next day. And we walked out, and our team looked there and said, our job is not to bring back power, our job is to bring back hope. And a couple things we did there, too. One of the things we did was that there had been other hurricanes in Florida, and the other utilities were getting killed. And um, I had talked with the governor, who at that time was Jeb Bush and folks, and we did something pretty radical, Sandy, if you remember with John Hutchinson, and Becca, I know at this time you were at the News Journal. We basically said, we're going to embed the press and our crews, and every morning at 7 when we give our assignments about what areas we're putting on first, we're going to invite the media to be in our meetings to show how transparent we are. Well, I've got to tell you, even Atlanta, our own company wasn't really sure that was the best thing to do. <laughs> And later, other parts of the, country, of the company uh, and in Florida would call John Hutchinson and say, how did you get these great stories? Because we had a, an, a writer, reporter from the St. Pete Times who had driven up and he'd written horrible stories about Florida Power and Light and at the time Progress Energy. We embedded him with Christy, who had 10-month-old twin boys, 
and he, we let him just follow her. He trailed her for two days. He ends up writing a story in the St. Pete Times at that point was the largest newspaper in the state about the sacrifice of utility workers during storms. So that event changed me personally and professionally for the better as a leader. And then the third example that I'll give is um, when I left Southern Company to go to American Water. So I was with Southern Company 31 years, very, it was a great career, loved the people. Hardest decision I've ever made in my whole life was to leave Southern Company. So about six months earlier, a friend of mine who was on the board of American Water called and said, our CEO is going to be retiring and we want to bring in a CFO for a period of time and then if they do well, they, they're going to be the next CEO. I said, I'm happy, thank you. Julia, is a woman, called me again about three months later and said, we're getting serious about this, I want you to do this. I said, no, I'm happy. She goes, just come and interview with the board. So I thought, well, okay, I mean, what, what damage could it do? I was 52, I'd only worked for one company, and I went up and interviewed, and I thought, this is a really cool place. And then about two weeks later, I met with the CEO for three hours, and he told me about this company, American Water. Now, there is actually an American Water um, operation here in Pensacola, I don't know if you're aware, but on, if you look across from University Mall, where, where um, uh, J.C. Penney, right across there, American Water, I've been out there several times, our call center. We have two national call centers, one in Alton, Illinois, and one here. And uh, we also run the Tampa, De Tampa Bay desalination facility in Tampa for the city of Tampa, and we partner with the Orlando Utility Commission on a warranty program we do in our unregulated business. But I decided to take the job, and it's the hardest decision I've ever made. 52 years, I grew up in the South, I went to school in the South, I worked for 31 years in the South, and here I am at 52 years old going to New Jersey. When I, <laughs> when I told the people at Southern, it was like, you're going to New Jersey? Wait, you're going to New Jersey? I said, New Jersey, yes, I will be working in New Jersey. So, um, but those are three times that I did something that it either demonstrated my leadership or I made a decision that made a big impact in my life. So I wanted to share those with you and I wanna share with you kind of American Water Now and the five things I've learned in my career before I roll, uh, finish up. So American Water is the largest water and wastewater utility. We're a $14.5 billion market cap company. Uh, we've been very financially successful. Uh, the past five years, I went five years ago, April 1st, our total shareholder return is 275%. So if you had invested $100 in um, January of 2013, today it would be worth $275. And just last year, we had a 29% return, which is if you had invested $100 at the end of the year, it would be worth 129 But the interesting thing about this is that's not our main focus. We think that's an outcome of doing business the way it should be done. We have an incredible team of people, and let me tell you, my job is easy because of the people who work for me. There's 7,000 employees around the country. We have a small operation in Canada, but it's mostly in the U.S. And interestingly, our board is 50% women. It was 60% women last year. We were recognized in New York as the S&P 500 company with the highest percentage of women on our board, but I believe in gender parity, so I have recruited men, so now we're 50-50. <laughs> And I was told that I'm the only CEO of an S&P 500 company that's actually said for gender parity, I recruited two men first part of this year so we could get to 50-50. Um, our executive team is 50% women. Um, and I have put all of those women in their jobs. So our chief financial officer is a woman, Linda Sullivan. I basically recruited her from a big utility in Southern California. Our head of our market-based businesses, our unregulated businesses, Deb DeGilio. Um, our head of HR, Melanie Kennedy. And the thing that's interesting is I'm in a company and we actually have gender parity and because we have gender parity, it's not a big deal. And I tell people and companies, if it's a board or your executives, once you get there, it just doesn't become a big deal because people get accustomed to working in an environment that is very inclusive and they don't want to go backward. You know, I mean, it's, it's just, I think that's a big reason that we have such a strong financial performance. So with that said, let me give you five kind of tips, the things that I've learned in my career, 36 years in utilities. Um, I've already told you that I was 21 when I graduated, so I can't go back to I was five when I started. But, um, but anyway, in my 31 years, or 36 years, here's what I've learned. Number one, very appropriate with where we are today. Get the education and experiences you need to be successful in whatever your field of endeavor is. 
for me, it was an engineering degree from Auburn, and then I worked. I went to at night and got my MBA, and through the company, I went to um, Oxford and Cambridge and um, went to Harvard just for special programs. But get the education experiences, and let me tell you, move around. I think one of the reasons that I've been successful as a leader is several times in my career, I've had 13 jobs in those 36 years, and they're all in totally different areas. In most areas, except nuclear, I never grew up in that organization. So I had to rely on the people who were there, who were the experts, to know how to do what they do. So the big thing is, be, be willing to move around. And there was one point in my career, I'd kind of stalled out, it was in the 1990s, and basically I took three lateral moves. Geographically, I moved from Birmingham to Atlanta, Atlanta to Montgomery, Alabama, and then back to Birmingham, all on lateral moves, meaning no promotions. But it filled out my resume, and after that I started getting promotions because I had filled out my resume. So number one, get the education and experiences you need to be the top success in your field of choice. Number two, and I think this is important, be a team player. You know, when you're a team player, I remember when I went in as an engineer in nuclear, and there were no other women engineers there, and at the, pl the plant, the first day I went in, it was like, wow, there's this girl, and she's an engineer. And then six months later is, well, she's an engineer, and oh yeah, by the way, she happens to be a woman. Because people just want to know, are you in it for us? And especially as you go up in leadership, are you in it for us? Or are you in it for you? Be a team player. Let people know you have their back. Because at the end of the day, times are going to be tough. And people need to know that they want to know that you're in the foxhole with them. Which is why getting out on the front lines is so important. And as Sandy said, that's one thing, it's favorite part of my job is going out and riding with our folks whether it was at Gulf Power or now whether it's American Water. Now at American Water, we serve all the way to California. So I get to go out and, you know, it's much nicer in California in January than it is in Pennsylvania, let me tell you. <laughs> but, um, but I also learned, it was interesting, I went out with some of our guys and they said, well, come out with us when it's bad weather. So we had a crew, broken water main, standing in water, ice. It was 25 degrees in Pennsylvania last year. I went out there with them in my... PPE, coldest I've ever been, snuck in some hand warmers when they couldn't see it. Because they were, I mean, they were standing in water fixing water mains, you know. But that one visit did more for my credibility with those folks on the front line than anything else I could have done. And especially going out in June, you know, when it's kind of nice there. So, so be a team player. Third thing is be a good communicator and build relationships. You don't have to be a great public speaker, but, you know, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Had, had a saying that I find so, so true in everything we do, M most of what he said, everything he said was amazing. But he said, when a dream lives on inside of others, it never dies. And what that says is, what good is what you know if others don't know what you know? And they're not going to know what you know until they know that you care. So you care about them, you're able to share things, and that dream can live on inside of other people. So being a good communicator, building relationships. And I'll give you a tip. For me, I had an interesting thing. When I was 35, I told you about my career kind of stalling for a bit. It wasn't just moving around. So I had a 360 assessment, and my direct reports got great scores, peers great scores. My boss had the lowest score. So I got a coach, and um, the coach said, Susan, you are so afraid of looking like you're sucking up that you're not spending the time building a relationship with your boss as you do with everybody else. And I was. I was like, I don't want to be the person that goes, oh, look at her nose. And, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I just didn't want to do that. And so, but I, I realized relationships are relationships. And, and the same as reaching out that frontline person, you need to make sure that people are comfortable with you. And that was a big turning point for me. So be a good communicator and build relationships. Fourth thing I'll tell you is be bold. You know, I got to tell you, I mean, first of all, moving around for lateral moves was a big deal. You know, making sure I didn't show any fear during until six days after Ivan was over and I finally went to my house, you know, after six days. Those are the things. Be bold. Let me tell you, here's the thing that concerns me the most about women in leadership. And Harvard did a big study on this about four or five years ago. Women are the ones that when we get opportunities, we go, I don't know if I'm ready for that. There is study after study, even today, that has shown men are promoted for their potential and women are promoted for their performance. Now, what's the problem with that? How are you going to be a CEO if you've never gotten the performance of being a CEO? And you have to be bold. I mean, look around and say, I can do that. 
Yeah, I mean, we all struggle with these insecurities. I, mean, I remember when I went to Oxford, I was 38 and I went for two months, company sent me on an executive education program. It's only three US citizens, 37 people from around the world, all these things. And I remember after about two days, I thought, I can hang with these people. <laughs> I mean, you know, I can hang with these folks. So we are our worst enemies so much of the time. Now, a big part of being bold, though, is being very open for feedback. I tell people all the time, and, and actually, I think this is something we have to learn. Sometimes when somebody tells us something, then we kind of go, ooh, and I don't like that, and it doesn't feel good. Or if you're a manager, you don't want to give people feedback. If you're a leader, you owe it to people to give them feedback. Worst thing is you don't give them feedback, then they end up being fired because they couldn't do the job, and they had no idea that they weren't doing feedback. So the first thing I tell everybody I work with, they make fun of it now. They go, if I give them feedback, they'll say, thank you, Susan, for the feedback. And then they give me feedback, and I say, thank you for the feedback. Because I have a development plan, even as CEO, I have a development plan, not that my board gives me. I do a 360 with my directs and the level below that, and they tell me what I need to work on. So be open to that, and it's weird. It doesn't make you less secure, it makes you more secure and confident when you're able to do that. So be bold. And the last one that I'll mention to you is be about others. So I gotta tell you, you know, a lot of those we talked about are things you do to get yourself in a good place. But when you get yourself in a good place, it is not about you. It is not about you. When you're the leader of the company, it is about the company and the people in the company. And by the way, when I say the company, a company is not a building, a university is not a building, it's not a piece of paper that incorporates you, it's the people who work in that company. So your company are the people, your organization are the people who work in that organization. So what are you doing to build them up? And as a leader, I will tell you this, I want whoever follows me in this job to be better than I am. And I want people who report to me to be better than I am. And I want them to tell me when we're about to mess up. And that's the real value of diversity, is when you have a team of people who think differently, who are different, it, it makes a world of difference because we have open debates and it doesn't matter that I'm the CEO and somebody else is this and we have people come in and we have one person who's in training and she's a, a professional who's just starting her career and she sits through our executive leadership team meetings and she challenges us on things and said, I don't think people are going to like this. We go, well, tell us more. You know, we, you have to be able to go out and help others. Here's what, the way I look at it. You know what real success is? Helping the people you work with develop beyond even what they thought they could be. That is the most fun of being a leader. It's when you can look and a person go, I never thought I could do this, and you told me I could, and I took a chance, and guess what I did? Look what I did. Be about others. Always take, when you get to a point that you can take real joy in the successes of others, do you know what that means about your own security and confidence? It takes really confident people to want to bring in people who are smarter than they are who are better than they are. But that's how you build great companies. And that's how you build great communities, by doing that. So those are five things. And what I want to close with are some personal stories, because I find these, um, this is what motivates me every day. So you say, I, I do have a lot of energy, so what gets me fired up? And Sandy alluded to it. It's the people I get to work with. So the one thing I would tell you, and I know how many people in here are students right now? Outstanding. Above all else, Find something that gives you passion, that you are passionate for and gives you purpose. That you have passion for and gives you purpose. Because then you don't work a day in your life. Have passion for it and let it give you purpose. When I graduated from college, there were some companies I would never have gone to work for. I could have never gone to work for a tobacco company, for example. There are some companies I just couldn't work for. I wanted to be part of something where the company made the world better. I wanted to be part of a group of people who pulled together to make the world a better place. And that may sound altruistic, but it's important to me, and it still is today. So find that. So let me tell you about American Water through the stories of four of our people. And these are all frontline folks. So we have a field service rep. He goes to people's houses. He checks their meters in Monterey, California. His name is Victor Munguia. Victor, Victor's wife is in a, uh, she's an assistant deputy for the county. He has three boys. He coaches Little League and he coaches Pee Wee football. I actually rode out with him four hours one afternoon visiting customer homes. 
One day, Victor is in his truck. He finished a service call, and he said just out of the side of his eye, he looked down this side road, and he thought he saw a small object moving ar across the road. And he started thinking, maybe it's a dog or something. But then he thought, I'm going to turn around and go back. So he turns around. He goes down the road. A baby had crawled out of its home very close to the road, and this was an infant crawling across a busy roadway. So Victor immediately stopped, scooped the baby up. It was obvious which home the baby went in. He went in. The mother, of course, as you might imagine, just fell apart. And when I talked to Victor about it, he goes, anybody would have done it. I said, but they didn't, Victor. You did it. So that's one. About every three months, I go to one of our call centers, either in Pensacola or in Alton, Illinois, and I listen in on cu customer calls because I want to make sure I stay, what, what are people really talking about? What are, the, what are their issues? And I'm sitting with one of our call center reps, Stephanie, in Alton, Illinois, and I see she's got these beautiful two boys. I said, Stephanie, tell me about your boys. She said, you know, Susan said, um, I was in an abusive home. My husband would beat up on me, and he would beat up on my boys. And she said, I had a friend who gave me the courage one night when he was asleep to get my boys, and we didn't have anywhere to go, but I had friends, and we were able to find a place. And I said, wow, I mean, this is a single mom at a job that doesn't have really high pay, and, um, and she said, and now I started a group, and I am chairman of a group now that's raising $50,000 a year to help women and children who are abused get out of those homes. This is a woman, single mom, two kids, victim of abuse, who is now making a difference in the entire Alton, Illinois, St. Louis, Missouri community. Those are very close together. She's incredible. She's absolutely incredible. So I found a pink superwoman cape and I sent it to her. <laughs> so it was awesome. It had an S and glitter. It was just awesome, awesome. So that's Stephanie. Now, another woman, Angelita Fasnacht. Angelita is one of our scientists. At American Water, we um, partner with the Environmental Protection Agency and the Centers for Disease Control. As the largest water utility in the country, we also have an R&D group with 15 scientists. We actually are doing a lot of work on emerging contaminants for water. Flint, Michigan had asked our folks to come in and say, you, we need help. We weren't making money off of them, we just wanted to go. Our lawyer said, well, can't really tell them what to do because you've got liability, but we figured out a way to where they could ask us how we do things and we could answer them. Um, so we have an amazing group, 10 PhDs, five masters that are working to, for example, the CDC, when the Ebola threat was out there, we worked with the CDC to set up protocol for how we would handle that. So we have a really amazing group of scientists. And one of those is Angelita Fasnacht. Angelita grew up in Colombia. And how many of you have heard of the terrorist group FARC? So Angelita, in 1998, as a 30-something, was named head of the water utility in rural areas of Colombia. And in that area, she basically did 200 projects over two years, brought clean water to 50,000 people. In these places, women and girls, girls couldn't go to school because all day, one gallon of water weighs 8.34 pounds. They would have to go get five gallons of water and walk four and five miles, even from unclean sources, just to have enough water to do basic cooking or sanitation. So Angelita is an engineer, she's brilliant. She decided she was gonna find a way to bring clean water to these places, and she did. She was so successful, in fact, that FARC kidnapped her. She was kidnapped in the jungles of Colombia for 32 days. And then they went to Angelita and said, we will let you go if you leave the country, and if you don't, we'll kill you and your family. So Angelita today has four kids. In addition to being a scientist for us, she's also president of the Global Water Alliance, and our company, in addition to United Way, is the largest contributor to the global uh, organization Water for People. And we've given $2 million over the past few years for clean water in places in Latin America and in Africa. And Angelita is absolutely incredible. I heard her story. And this is the thing about women leaders. I said, Angelita, how did you choose our company to come apply for? She said, I Googled and saw that you had a female CEO. <laughs> it's amazing. And then the last person I will talk about, um, he is a backhoe operator in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and his name is Herbie Sims. And Herbie, every morning, gets in his backhoe, and he goes down the street, and you can hear the backhoe, the loud. And every morning, there's a three-year-old named Connor who goes out on his porch, because every day when Herbie goes by, he beeps the backhoe horn at him. <laughs> and he did this for about six months, and Connor's mother was so touched, she called our office there and said, I need the name of this gentleman because I need you to understand something. Connor is severely autistic. 
And our mornings don't start out real well. And the one time of day when he is joyful is between 8.30 and 9 when he goes on that front porch and Herbie comes by and beeps that horn. So we found out about it. We bought some toy trucks for Connor and his brother Logan. And Herbie wanted to take his wife. They bought more toys. They went and played with these boys for two hours. And afterwards, at the end, Connor came up to Herbie and wrapped his arm around his leg and wouldn't let him go. And his mother started crying. She said, you need to understand something. Connor hates to be touched. His therapist is not going to believe this. A backhoe operator, Scranton, Pennsylvania, beeping a horn every morning for a kid. Changes lives. Very few people get the privilege and honor of working with their heroes every day. When I was at Gulf Power, when I was in Power Company, I got to do that, and now I'm at American Water. I get to do it also, and I got to do, get to do it all across the country. I mean, that, that's what it's all about. You choose what you do based on the difference you make in the lives of people. It, it, it's incredible the joy you feel. And I'm blown away by the people I get to work. My biggest challenge today is to deserve to be their leader because they're so amazing. So I get asked a lot, just to wrap it up, I get asked a lot, so what do you want your legacy to be? And there's two things that I really think that when I retire that I want people to say. One is, at least the company I'm at now, and Southern and Gulf Power are always very good at safety. When I came to this company, our safety record was terrible. So the first thing I did as CEO, and, all the, and by the way, we are a 49% union. We have uh, 18 different unions and 79 union contracts across the country. So we had bad relationships with the labor unions. I immediately went to Washington, met with the labor leaders. We resolved those issues. And today, we have half the accidents we did five years ago. Still too many, but we have half. And after the end of this year, we have a goal that we're going to put that number in half. So if the one legacy is related to the best compliment I've ever gotten since I've been at American Water. Um, and he doesn't know that I know this, but our president of Virginia American was talking to a regulator and said, How, how's Susan doing? He knew me from way back. And Barry told him, he said, I think there are people alive today because she's here. So if the only thing when I retire is that somebody's alive because I was there and put an emphasis on safety, regardless of cost or anything else, it'd be worth it. That's enough for me. But the other thing, and this fits into this, is it is possible to run financially successful companies. 275% TSR. We are the fastest growing dividend grower. We are in the S&P 500. You can do that, and you can still make safety a priority regardless of what it costs to get the right equipment and the pr protective equipment. You can run a company that's financially successful when you engage employees. We have 100,000 hours of training every year. We have a requirement that every single one of our employees, union, non-union, management, non-management, has to do 20 hours of formal training every year, off the job doing their training. We have a requirement. It's in our goals that we do that. You can have a company that delights customers. We're rolling out artificial intelligence, and our goal in three years is to lead the entire utility industry, not water, but electric and gas. We hired a guy who's got eight artificial intelligence patents to head up our technology organization. You can have a company that grows. You can have a company that does all this, puts people first, whether they're your employees, customers, communities. We have a charitable foundation. Every September, basically all of our employees work in groups called Americans across the country donating work in our communities to make communities better in addition to our foundation. You can do all of this and still be financially successful. In fact, I would tell you, doing this long term makes you more financially successful because you're a place where people want to come to work, you're a place on the regulated side of the business where you have credibility, and you're a place where communities love to have you there. And you're a place where customers say, I am so glad that I get my water from American Water because I know that it's clean and it's safe and I can give it to my kids and not worry. So that's my story. Susan's story, it's my story. Um, I, I have to tell you, it was very special coming back here. Um, there's a reason that this is where we're retiring. We still have our main house here. I fly here two to three weekends a month. I have a place in downtown Philadelphia, work in South New Jersey, and our main house is here. My husband and I had been here one month in 2003 and said this is home, and this is home. Uh, importantly, Carol Carlin, I was talking to her. She said, who does your hair? I said, I still have my hair done here. 
I do. I swear I do. I am the, I am, I'm the person who travels the furthest to get my hair done at this particular place. So I love this place. This is home. It will always be home, and one day I'll be back here full time. But I just want to thank you. And the last thing I want to leave you with is life every day is a gift. Oh, my gosh. Every day is a gift, and it's what you make it to be. And I know you have bad days and good days, but let me tell you, your worst day is probably something that you can still give to somebody else to help them on the day they're having that's even worse. Making a difference is doing the things that are being about others. So thank you. I appreciate it.